Have you ever been in a public speaking class? Raise your hand if you ever attended one of those, maybe in high school, maybe in college, speech class. It was one that, for a lot of folks, was kind of a scary thing. I enjoyed it, but uh, I'd be more afraid of pu public piano playing uh, if that was a class. So we all have different, different gifts. Uh, public uh, special music class, singing solos. Uh, I'm so glad that there are people who enjoy and can bless us with these things. But in a public speaking class, w probably the most scary part of it was not the planned speeches, but when they got to the semester, that part in the semester when you had the impromptu speeches, extemporaneous, where you'd reach your hand into a box or a basket or a hat, pull out a card, and then you had to give a speech on that. Now your teacher, at least mine, gave us like five minutes to prepare, so you got to prepare while the other person ahead of you was going, but you didn't know what you were gonna get to speak on, and you had to come up with something on the fly. Now, last week, we studied Peter's first sermon. And something we didn't talk about, but that should be obvious if you think about it, is that Peter did not prepare that sermon in advance. Although, in another sense, he did. Uh, but he certainly did not have a written manuscript or an outline. It was an impromptu, an extemporaneous sermon. And today, as we get into Acts chapter 3, and I invite you to open your Bibles there, we're going to see Peter has another extemporaneous, impromptu sermon. His second sermon, Acts chapter 3. I can remember, uh, I can remember in a preaching class in seminary, uh, Dwight Nelson was our teacher for that one, and we had a book that we all were supposed to be reading, and then he would draw a name out of a old thing, and he took great pleasure doing the suspense and, and oh, who is it? And, and then he'd call on you, and you had to go up, and you had to do a devotion based on that day's assigned reading. He said, because when you go back to your churches, you're going to go to Dorcas, you're going to go to the community service, you're going to go here or there, and they'll say, Pastor, could you share a word? And you'll need to come up with something on the fly. So he was saying, this is good practice. And Peter had been practicing, but not in preaching, he had been spending time with the one that he loved to talk about. Acts chapter 3, we've already heard the, the story that gets this thing going. What a wonderful story. Thank you, Sherry. So we're going to start in verse 11, because the man was healed miraculously. There was no denying that he had been lame for years and years and years and years. Everybody knew him. Everybody recognized him. And then we get to verse 11. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, not because he couldn't support himself, but because he just wanted to be with the people that had helped bring him uh, newfound freedom. It says, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. A group gathered. Remember, we talked about that recently. When things happen, groups of people come together. Now, it's interesting that they're there in Solomon's porch because only a few months earlier, Jesus had given instructions and a little mini sermon on that porch. But the reaction was something that was different from what we'll see with Peter's sermon. The reaction of the people was they wanted to stone Jesus. They wanted to kill him. And now, just a few months later, big things have happened. A resurrection has happened. And now another miracle has happened, and they gather to see what had happened. Verse 12 says, so when Peter saw it, he responded. Peter didn't want to waste a good opportunity. He saw there's a group. There's been a, a miraculous healing. Here's an opportunity. So he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look intently at us as though our own power or good godliness through, through this we had made this man walk? Now this is amazing. I'm not sure which is a big, bigger miracle, the healing of the man who had been born crippled or the healing of a, a man named Peter who had formerly been boastful, egotistical, 
wanting to take credit and glory for himself, and now he's a humble man. Why are you looking at us? It's not because of us. It's not because of our own power, and it's not because of our own godliness. This was Peter who not long before had said, I will never, if everybody denies you, it won't be me. I will die for you, Jesus. And now Peter's saying, hey, don't look at me. It's not me. Peter had been converted. A change had taken place in Peter's life. It wasn't us. Verse 13. And where does he direct the people to in verse 13? Who does he start talking about? The God of who? Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob. Now, you remember last time in, in his first sermon, there was a crazy event, a strange phenomena, the, the Holy Spirit coming down and the sound of the wind and, and all these things. These things happened. Uh, and then Peter goes into a sermon, and he starts it by talking about Old Testament things and Old Testament prophecy. And then he, he says the explanation for this event is in the Old Testament. And ultimately, it's found in Jesus, who is Lord and Christ. And now, once again, there's a strange, unique phenomena. A guy that's been crippled for his entire life is healed. And Peter's going to provide an explanation for it. And he's providing an explanation from the Old Testament. He's going to involve prophecy, and it's going to end up pointing to Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the Holy One of God. So he says the God of Abraham, tying it in to the, the, their forefathers and the, the pillars of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified who? Jesus, but specifically before that, how is he described? His servant, Jesus. Now, with a rich background in the Old Testament, the servant motif, the servant description is something that comes out of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 53. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 18, he quotes Isaiah 42, verse 1, because it was a fulfillment, uh, a prophetic fulfillment that found its fulfillment in Jesus. The servant. And Isaiah 53 mentions the suffering servant. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. It talks about Jesus who went like a lamb to the slaughter. It doesn't mention Jesus by name. It mentions this servant. But as you study it, it's obviously a prophecy that finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And Peter's hearers, who were attuned to these Old Testament prophecies, probably many of them recognized this language. This servant who would suffer and take away the sins on our behalf, that servant is Jesus, whom God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appointed uh, to these things. It says, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Again, like last, like last week, we saw Peter is not backing down. He's not afraid or shy this time. He's saying, you guys did it. Let me ask you something. Who killed Jesus? Who killed Jesus? Yeah. The Romans put the nails in. There were the people in the day that, that said, no, give us Barabbas. You and I killed Jesus. As much as those people did then, you and I are equally responsible for the death of Jesus. He would have died just for my sin alone. We put him there too. We killed Jesus. Denied, de denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Verse 14, but you denied the Holy One. That's a phrase that's used, the Holy One, over 40 times in the Old Testament, and it's talking about God. Peter is, again, taking Old Testament language and applying it now to Jesus. You denied the Holy One, 
the just, and asked for a murderer. Who was the murderer? Barabbas. Asked the murderer be granted to you, and you killed the prince of life. That's kind of a paradox, isn't it? How could the prince of life be killed? And there are some people today who are, who are trying to make Jesus into a created being who came later on. No, no, no. He's the prince of life. Life comes through him. He's always been around and always will be around. But he died on that cross, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses, Peter says. He died, he rose again, and we're witnesses to these things. Now again, he's, he's trying to explain the miracle that just happened, that just took place. How, how did this guy get healed? Well, it's not us. He's trying to explain the miracle. And through these Old Testament uh, allusions and prophecies, he's pointing to Jesus. And then verse 16, and his name, the name of Jesus, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of of you all. What's the explanation? How did this happen? Well, it happened because of Jesus, the Prince of Life, the Holy One, the suffering servant from Isaiah's prophecies. He's the reason why this man is healed. Verse 17, yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. You didn't know what you were doing fully. And what did Jesus say when he hung on the cross? Forgive them, Lord, because they don't know what they're doing. Uh, now, there still was culpability there, but they did it in ignorance. Verse 18, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of how many of his prophets? All of his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Again, pointing it to the prophecies of the Old Testament, rooting Jesus, not as a, as a new teacher out of nowhere, but as someone who had been spoken of beforehand. And what does he say that they should do in response? Verse 19, repent therefore and be converted. Remember, last time we talked about repentance, which is you're going one way towards sin. Jesus gets a hold of your life, gives you the gift of repentance, and you choose to turn away. You choose to turn away. But notice here, repentance is connected to something else. What's that other word? Yeah, that's right. Conversion. Conversion. How do you know if you're converted? Well, if you have no desire to repent for the sin in your life, you're probably not converted. Now, the reality is, as you go on through your Christian journey, Jesus leads us through deeper levels of conversion and, and new ways we need to repent. But if you have no desire to repent or change, this should trouble you. This should tell you, hey, I need to get down on my knees and ask God to give me a converted heart. Give me a heart that, that wants to be repentant, that wants to change. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come. The times of refreshing. Who needs refreshing here? Do you need refreshing? Now, specifically for us in our day, that's the greatest fulfillment of this in our day is the, the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because the, the mission is impossible without that. Now, that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't be working Right? Because remember, we talked earlier how the Holy Spirit will fall and people all around will be saying, I don't see anything going on. What's going on? We need the refreshing. We need to be converted and repenting of our sins so that the refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Verse 20, and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. So before Jesus comes back, the refreshing has to happen. Verse 21, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken of by the mouth of how many of his prophets? All his holy prophets. Since when? 
Since the world began, prophet after prophet has been pointing in one way or another to the time when Jesus would return. Pointing forward to that day. And then he points to Moses. Uh, and, and if they could relate to somebody, it would be Moses. Verse 22, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you what? A prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. He's now interpreting these ancient words from Moses, and he is saying, the prophet has come. You killed him. You did it ignorantly, but he came back to life again, and he wants to come back. But he needs you to repent. He needs you to be converted. He needs you to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit. And then Peter, he's speaking extemporaneously here. So in verse 23, he doesn't exactly quote the passage as you'll find it in Deuteronomy 18, verse 19. Um, but he says there, And it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Deuteronomy 18, verse 19 uh, says something a little bit differently than that. Basically says, you'll hear his words and you need to be accountable for what you hear. Um, but ultimately, unfortunately, those who do hear the words of Jesus and reject them, um, they will, God will give them what they want. You don't want to be with me? You don't have to be. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, um, there's no place in the restoration where God's glory and presence won't be. And so God will have to give people ultimately what they want. Um, eternal death. Separation from him. Verse 24. Yes, all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. When we read the Old Testament, we should be looking for these prophecies that point forward to Jesus, to his return, to the restoration of all things. Verse 25, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You remember that promise from, from early on in Genesis? Now, unfortunately, today, that prophecy and, and those, those words have been misunderstood. People today, even in our political system, think that blessings will come to us and our nation if we give money and missiles to Israel. But notice how Peter, who walked with Jesus, who was taught by Jesus, understood and applied the words. Notice what he says here. The prophecy, the, the statement of blessing through Abraham and through his seed, it's not about money and missiles. Notice what it's about. Verse 26, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to do what? To bless you. So the blessing comes through Jesus. That's, that's the blessing that, that God wanted ultimately to come through as the great fulfillment of this promise through the descendants of Abraham. And he says it comes first to you. Remember, Paul says first to the Jew and then the Gentile. Jesus, the people of Jesus were first given the opportunity to receive the blessing of Abraham's seed. Amen. That's right. First, God, having raised up his servant, there's that language of the servant, the prophetic servant, sent him to bless you, turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So again, when you encounter Jesus, if Jesus doesn't make you want to be more like him, then you probably haven't encountered Jesus. We want to make God in our own image too many times. We want a God in our own image, just a little God we can set on the shelf that says, you're okay, live in sin, you'll be fine. That's another way that we make a graven image, a God in our own image. We want a God that we can handle and we can process. But the God who loves us and saves us freely, salvation is through grace alone, it's not through our deeds, but that God says, I love you too much to leave you the way you are. 
I love you too much to, to leave you as a bitter and, 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 and backstabbing person. I want to make you more loving. I love you too much to, to leave you as a gossip, as a complainer. I want to transform your life. I love you too much to leave you fearful. I want to give you boldness. I love you too much to leave you lustful. I want to make you pure and holy. And so Peter preaches this sermon just off the cuff. But it wasn't like he hadn't prepared because he had been preparing for the last three and a half years. He'd been preparing for the last 40 days. And notice the response as we, as we just peek into the chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they had taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, remember, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection at all, right? And so this was especially troubling to that group of people. But the rest of them, they didn't want Jesus being preached. So what'd they do? Verse 3, they laid their hands on them, and they weren't doing it to anoint them or to bless them, to pray over them. They were laying hands to lock them up. Put them into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, praise God for this however. Verse 4, last verse, many of those who heard the word did what? They believed... And the number of the men, not to count the women and the children, so a much bigger group, but the number of the men came to about how many? 5,000 people. So early, early on, there were perhaps, if we double the amount, that's at least 10,000, and we had some kids, 15, maybe 20,000. This group is ballooning and expanding. So what do we take from the story today? Well, number one, we see that our God is a powerful God. Uh, but I want to think about this. Uh, the church grew because the good news was proclaimed. Because Jesus was, was shared publicly. And it wasn't merely a bumper sticker that they had on the back of their carts. <laughs> Jesus was proclaimed boldly and actively, intentionally. Peter sensed an opportunity, and he took it. Have you ever had an opportunity for something good, and you chicken, chicken out? I know I have. Peter sensed this opportunity. I remember when I was at Andrews, and I was in line at the finance department, and I saw this attractive, tall young lady get in line a couple people back, and I thought, this is an opportunity. And I knew, I already was aware of who she was uh, through her sister. I knew she was in the PT department, and it's like two silos that don't have any interaction on that campus. And I was like, this is your one chance. This is your one opportunity. You're going to wish you had taken it, or are you going to make something of it? And I took the opportunity. I took the risk. And one thing led to another, and I don't know if you can see me, honey, in the mother's room, but I love you, and I'm so glad I did. Yeah, long story short, here we are today. You're going to get opportunities to do something for God this week. Peter had that opportunity. He'd been preparing through his lifestyle, and it took, he took it. This group of people, this unique grouping of people, wouldn't have been there in that spot in that way ever again. He took the opportunity, and souls were saved. The church grew. This week, I don't know what kind of opportunities God will give you. Maybe it's with your family. Maybe it's calling up a discouraged friend of yours. Uh, maybe it's getting into a conversation at the grocery store with someone. By the way, have you ever been in a good conversation and you, you thought, man, I wish I had something about God to give them as I leave? Enter glow tracks. <laughs> right? If you don't have them, you can't give them. So if you don't carry something with you in your purse, your car, I'm down to one glow track. 
in my car. I, I need to restock. And by the way, they're in the lobby, and, and they're, they're like a whole bunch of them. If you go around the corner by the library, there's a whole bunch on the wall. Take some. Take some. You never know when you might want to share with someone. You never know when God might prompt you to pray for someone. Pray with your neighbor who's struggling and having a difficult time. Moments and opportunities are precious. Do you want to be used by God this week? When God presents you, and he will, with opportunities, whether obvious or subtle, do you want to say yes? Do you want to say like the song says, I will go, Lord. Here I am. Use me. I want that to be true in my life. How about you? Let's pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you want to use us. We're grateful that you want to grow the church. We're grateful that um, you'll give us what we need as we prepare day by day. As we fill our hearts up with your love, how can it not overflow? As we take practical steps and and get glow and we get uh, other resources Uh, Lord, I know you'll give us opportunities, and this week, Lord, let us use them. And let us see how you can speak through us, like you spoke through Peter, somebody who, who had a lot of problems in their life, but you worked on him, you changed him, you helped him to repent, you helped him to grow, and he was used in a big way. So, Lord, use us too, we pray. Help us to, to truly be converted day by day. Show us how we can more honor you in our lives. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say, amen and amen.